So you're watching this 1969 black and white documentary that I think is just amazing. I'm David Hoffman, documentary filmmaker, and you know if you've been watching my films, I love Southern music. I love country, I love mountain, I love blues, I love Delta music. And very rarely do I come upon a guy like me who's a real expert and who recorded that 1969 film. Well, if you don't want no trouble, you don't miss my girl. So I'm going to be talking to Bill Ferris. He's a professor. He's a kind of a musicologist. He's a filmmaker. And I want to get a sense from him of what he was thinking and seeing when he recorded these old things. So, Bill, we're looking at Sonny. I believe I just my And he's amazing, 1969. What got you to do that back then? I was following my heart. As a kid, I grew up on a farm. And when I was about five, a black lady named Mary Gordon would take me to a church on the farm every first Sunday. And I learned to sing the hymns there. I learned to love the sermons. And as I grew older, I realized that there were no hymnals in that church. And when the families were no longer there, that music would disappear. So I began to record and I made a pledge to the people with whom I worked that I would tell their story in unvarnished ways, everything that they had experienced, I would put on the pages and on the film and photography work that I did. Can we see him running, uh, sitting around the table, uh, oh. and uh, he had the whole uh, the 12 uh, sitting around there with him, uh, oh. and uh, he got the bread, uh, and he passed it around, uh, oh. and uh, he got his blood, uh, and he passed it around, uh, oh. and uh, he told them to drink he all, uh, oh. yes, because this is the blood, uh, yes, of the New Testament. Uh, oh. Bill is a Southern guy. A Southern guy grew up in the 1950s, came from Southern people. My experience, come being a Northerner, coming down then to the South, people like him didn't talk to Black people. It was like two different worlds. What in you created the fascination and the acceptance to move into that other culture? I grew up on this farm, and my family were the only white family there. There were numerous black families and they were my extended family. I played with children my age and it was only when I began to go to school at the age of five that I left the farm and went to an all-white school. This was Jim Crow segregated worlds and my black friends went to a black school on the farm. In my school, each teacher taught two grades. In their school, one teacher taught six grades. And that was the beginning of my sense of injustice. I complained to my parents and they said, this is the way our world is and you have to learn to deal with it. But I never adjusted. I always felt it was wrong, and it was the beginning of my attempt to build a bridge across the troubled waters of race and class, all the things that I felt somehow responsible for changing. So you're like my ideal filmmaker because you're filming your culture right in your neck of the woods. I think beautifully. There's this guy, Ray Lum, that movie. George Smith over on the corner of Second North and Clay, he needed somebody. He'd give me $3 and my dinner. 
So I went over and went to watch Mr. George Smith, Mr. Keith Phoenix, to give me my dinner, dinner time, noon. One day a fella come along with a little horse. And I bought his little horse, give him twelve and a half for him. Tied him over there to the post. Well, before night came, long came a fella, and I sold him to him for twenty-five dollars. Made one percent, as the Dutchman says. So, uh, a few days later, another one come up with the horse. I bought him and give fifteen for him. Horses were cheap then. The little horse was thin, but he was young. So I gave him fifteen dollars for him. Tied him over there to the post. Mr. Smith said, Ray, he said, don't you think you could make more money out trading than you could here? Oh, I says, I don't know, Mr. George, but I'll try it. I grew up in a world where there were people who were really greater than life as I look back on it, but I took them for granted. And one was Ray Lum. How old would you guess I was? Just guess it, not giving a D. Uh, you don't have a week, you know, if they go hang you, they don't take that long to hang you. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm 81. 81. I'll be 82 my next birthday. Well, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and if you need any saddlebags, I've got them. This is to put your money in, or uh, your pistol, or uh, your whatever you want to put in there, don't you? It was only after I began to do my films on blues and the church that my father suggested you should really think about doing a film on Ray Lum because there's never been another storyteller, a auctioneer, a trader like him. And I began to work with him thinking I could do something in a few weeks. Well, it took over a decade and I never hit bottom. I went to Memphis and I went to Fort Worth and I bought an almost a train load of horses and I carried them to Clarksdale and I was laying back in the caboose and all the way riding along, hey, $50, $55, $60, $70, $75, $75, $80, $82, $83, $84, $85, $86, $87, $88, $89, $90, $91, $92, $93, $94, $95, $96, $97, $98, $99, $99, $99, $99, $99, $99, $99, $99, $99, $
Oh, take one stick and see how easily one stick breaks. And now take the eight sticks together, and nobody could break them. Instead of a family sticks together, they could never break. And my pictures are just mostly from little memories, more like a family album. Just, well, when you think of one cute thing, then you'll think of something else. And, and, uh, and my pictures are just from little memories. One of my little grandsons got lost once. I want to make one of that. And it stayed lost a while, you know. Here in town, but still. We all were so afraid, you know. And uh, just lots of little things I want to make a picture of. And you see, if you feel lonesome and uh, embroidery, you can't think of it yourself. You have to think of this tree. You have to think of the things you're making. You don't have time to be lonesome. You don't have time for anything but to think about that. The source of these stories, B.B. King once said to me, is kind of like the birth of life on the floor of the ocean. It's a mystery, but there are a lot of threads that feed in the animal tales and protest tales of Africa and African-American people, the Irish and English stories, the raconteurs like Ray Lum, uh, who would tell these stories that could go on for days if you were willing to sit and listen. In many ways, there's a mystery there, and that's part of their beauty. There's no full answer to why. I come up the hard way. Been on a farm all of my days. Never been in no trouble. Well... Never been resting kid and locked up in jail in my life. My mother taught me from a baby till I got big enough to know to get out on my own. I love to meet anybody with a smile and face. That's the way I live. That's the way I hope I'll go that way. So it's 1969, and you're looking at this penitentiary in the South. I have always been drawn to Parchman Penitentiary, which is a legendary place, 28 thousand acres of penal farm where inmates are really at the mercy of the bosses who run these camps. Low hard neighbor just above a knee. That's that thing you call a stingery. And when I went there, they were farming the cotton with hoes. And I just showed up at the gate and the warden said, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing a book on music and I wondered if there were any work chants still sung here. He said, will you go up to Camp B? When I first came here, it was uh, 1934, November the 5th. Parchment. Just put it up then. You had to go ahead. Well, whatever you had you doing, you had to run with it. I rolled so hard and told him to go to eat done, I couldn't couldn't eat with a spoon and nothing to shake off. Been so nervous, you know. But I made it. I made it through all right. As part of your broad fascination with your culture and the cultures that are around you, you do this gospel thing, 
gospel music has always attracted me because in many ways it's very similar to blues and rhythm and blues. Uh, I asked a blues musician what the difference was, and he said, you simply change my Lord and put in my baby, and you've gone from gospel to blues. under the possession of spirits. They sing this incredibly powerful music, the music of gospel, which means good news. Now, hogs, I mean, Okay, I can understand the great stuff you were filming back then, these great musicians, but hogs get you also. Is that because you're a farm boy? My parents knew all the things I was doing, and they said one day, we have this friend who knows a man who's trained his pigs to pray before they eat, and we think you should make a film of that. Hey, now, everybody's tend to listen at me good. I should have moved down a little further, but I want you to wait a minute. All right, come on down a little further. Come on down, come on. Come on, Walker. Hey, now, that's all right. Be careful, be quiet. Hush, hog it, hush. All right, I want up close to everybody. Thank you. This not me good. And watch me well. He had trained these pigs to make them respect order as he tried to feed them their food in a trough. He had them pray. May the Lord bless what we're about to see. That is nothing to the body. Christ's sake. Amen. Thanks the Lord. Come on. That's called Hush, Hoggies, Hush. That's the title of his prayer that he would recite. That's really wonderful, Bill. Really wonderful. There's so much richness in your culture. I envy it. I come from Levittown, Long Island. We had a culture, but it wasn't any real culture. When I came south in early 1965 to film Bascom Lamar Lunsford, I was in love. I had found my home. So I understand what you're doing. We connected, you and I, because of B.B. King. I recorded B.B. Yes. King, Sing Sing Prison. You admired it. You recorded B.B. King, 1975, with a pretty amazing documentary. So what is your sense of that man? I gave mine in my film, but how do you see B.B. King? The man says, why I sing the blues is because I lived it. I know how it feels. When you're hurt, you gotta tell somebody. Someone must understand how you feel. The only way to do it is say it loud and clear, make sure that everyone will hear. It's the truth the way it is. That's why I sing the blues. This is B.B. King making a statement and a natural fact. All you gotta do is sit back and dig where it's coming from. Listen, not only with your ear, but with your heart. B.B. had a fourth grade education and his great dream was to see the blues taught within the academic world. I was teaching at Yale in the 70s, and in my music course, I taught B.B. King's blues. And I gave a lecture at a black music conference, and afterwards, a young black woman came up and said, I'm B.B.'s manager, and he would like to meet you, and if you're interested, he would like to come to your class. Well, he came 
And my students were forever transformed and will never forget it. We eventually gave B.B. an honorary doctorate of humane letters. B.B. was the most gentle, modest, self-effacing person. He would make you feel like you were the most important person in the room, when in fact, the most important person was B.B. You know you me wrong. This man who drove a tractor in the cotton fields became the greatest musician of the blues in history. I adored him. I looked up to him. This man who grew up without a family in Itabina, Mississippi, told me that his family was his audience. And when he played and looked out at those faces, he played to them as if they were his family. That was just beautiful. I had that experience during that short period that I was with him, but I could not have articulated it as what you just did. That's right. You know, there are people who are superior, who are the, like the, the people who give you the lessons of life. He was one. So today, when you're down and out or feeling like you're getting old, does the music and culture that you come from still give it to you? Like to me, when I come out of the doctor's office, I play bluegrass going home in the car. That's the music that always makes me feel good. I view this music like good whiskey. It improves with age. Well, Mama told Papa about a little something she heard. And Papa told Mama, don't believe none of that. That boy is a man. It just cuts through to your heart. And the older I get, the more I love it. I got the ramble. I got the ramble. I got the ramble. Women would give you the blues, you know. A woman tell you that I love you and all that and you and you go and find out she loving somebody else. Well you can't have nothing but the blood. It's like a good book. You can read and reread Huck Finn or The Invisible Man. And this music will always be the key to my heart. back to feelings, how you feel today. You know, blues has always been something that you don't have to be black to have the blues. You can have blues. Wake up in the morning, the sun is blue on you. You understand what I'm talking about? Around your bed. And you don't got blue. You understand? Your old lady just quit you. And you blue. <laughs> so you understand what I'm talking about? So you ain't back at the blues sometime or another. You understand what I'm talking about? I know you had the blues. Now, have you ever had the blues? I always felt that I was invisible. 
that the camera was my eye and I would not judge what people said or did. Uh, I would simply follow their world. And I think they understood that because they gave me a kind of warmth and access. Now, I'm going to tell you about the life of the blues. And this is the blues. Living ain't easy and times are tough. Money scarce, we all can't get enough. Now, my insurance is lapsed and my food is low. And the landlord knocked at my door. Now, last night I dreamed I died. The undertaker came to take me for a ride. I couldn't afford a cast and bum was so high. I got from my sick bed because I was too poor to die. Now, ain't that blue? I was a pilgrim on a journey. And I felt if I simply followed my heart, I would connect with their hearts. And what would come from that would be a true and honest portrait. Papa Daddy, I was taken completely by surprise. Papa Daddy's about a million years old and has got this long, long beard. Papa Daddy, sister says she fails to understand why you don't cut off your beard. So Papa Daddy lays down his knife and fork. He's real rich. Mama says he is. He says he isn't. So he says, have I heard correctly? You don't understand why I don't cut off my beard? Why, I says, Papa Daddy, of course I understand. I did not say any such of a thing, the idea. He says, Huzzy. I says, Papa Daddy, you know I wouldn't anymore want you to cut off your beard than the man in the moon. It was the farthest thing from my mind. Stella Rondo sat there and made that up while she was eating breast of chicken. But he said, so the postmistress fails to understand why I don't cut off my beard, which job I got you through my influence with the government. Bird's nest, is that what you call it? Not that it isn't the next to smallest P.O. in the entire state of Mississippi. I says, oh, Papa Daddy, I says, I didn't say any such a thing. I never dreamed it was a bird's nest. I've always been grateful, though this is the next to smallest P.O. in the state of Mississippi. And I do not enjoy being referred to as a hussy by my own grandfather. Bill, isn't it lucky you and I that we got to know you a lot and me a fair amount? of these people that your people and these cultures in this wonderful, unique way of Southern culture. When I looked at your films of Bascom, Lamar Lunsford, and then at B.B. King at Sing Sing, I wept. Uh, you went into those worlds with an open heart and they knew it they would not have allowed you the intimacy and the beauty of access uh, that you filmed. It just took my heart away to see what you did as a young filmmaker. And I totally identify with you. You're a soulmate in the truest sense. And I hope one day I'll have the chance to meet you in person. I will do my best to make this into a beautiful film that is a record of you and I on this day in 2021. It's gonna play on YouTube forever for not only our people and the people that come after us, but for everybody. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, David. I'll be in touch. Yeah, bro.